Hi everybody, this is Dan Stolbarger. Welcome back to our deep dive study through the book of Revelation. And um, we're going to pick it up in the second part of chapter 19. But before we get started, a couple things. One, make sure you get the PDF PowerPoint that accompanies this YouTube. It's available on the YouTube channel. There should be a link for that. Or you can go to our website at holygroundexplorations.com. And then the second thing, this is the Word of God. So let's have a moment to pray, to prepare our hearts for what God has for us this evening. Jesus, we come before you, and we would ask now that you would give us clarity of thought. We pray against any distractions whatsoever that we could focus in on your word, that we would study to show ourselves approved, that we would be as the sons of Ishakar that understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And like the Bereans that applied themselves diligently to your word. So we pray you'd be with us now as we jump into this gift of the revealing of the book of Revelation. Be with us now in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to pick it up in verse 17. If you remember last week, the theme was there are two suppers in chapter 19. The first supper you want to be a part of, RSVP. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You will, if the rapture comes in our lifetime, be caught up to be with him. You will be part of the marriage feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is the first supper that's mentioned in chapter 19, and you want to be a part. Now, for this, the rest of this chapter, it will talk about the second supper. And this is one that you do not want to attend because you've been invited to the first. But the second one, when you look carefully on the menu, you are on the menu. And so again, not want to attend this one. So verse 17 says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, it's dinner time, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And then verse 19. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And by the way, Jesus and you and me, hopefully, this army that follows Jesus at the second coming. <clears throat> and then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who works signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And then back to that invitation to the birds, right? The carrion. All and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So now some things we want to unpack here. First of all, note, there is not the slightest mention 
of any kind of struggle here. Psalm 2 records a conversation amongst the Trinity, laughing at the arrogance of the kings of the earth who are taking up arms against God to make war. And John does not write any sort of description about any kind of battle. This is entirely one-sided, more of a simple act of judgment rather than a prolonged war or battle. The battle of Armageddon is the laughter of God against the climax of man's arrogance. Barnhouse will go on to say as we read through this about the beast and the false prophet that later in chapter 20, we're going to find a thousand years has passed and guess what? They're still there. Which we'll talk a little bit about the doctrine of annihilation and why that is not biblical. And again here, we're going to find that the rest were killed by the sword, and that's the, always the image of the word of God, which proceeded from his mouth. In 2 Thessalonians 2.8, we read that the Antichrist will be destroyed by the brilliance of his coming. And last week, we talked about some of this brilliance of clothed in white, clothed in light, and the sun shining in full strength does not compare to what is yet to come. And then we've got all of this, might as well touch upon this now before we continue. The place of the dead. We have a lot of different we, different idioms and examples of the place of dead. In, in the Hebrew mindset, you have Sheol, the abode of the dead. We're giving a little bit more of a description when Jesus talks about Abraham's bosom, that there's a gulf between the two sides, and you have the poor man and Lazarus, or the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man's on one side, dying of dehydration and thirst, begging that this servant of his that's in Abraham's bosom would just dip his finger in water to put on his tongue. So that's a description of Sheol, a place of the dead. Also referred to as Hades. And then we have the example that Jesus gave when he died on the cross and the thief on the cross next to him. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So all of these together seem to be the abode of the dead before God finalizes, because later we're going to read he's going to take all of those things, Sheol, Hades, and he's going to dump it all into the lake of fire, and it's going to be over at that point in time. So again, just some of these images that are floating and, and I will say this as we continue on. There's different thoughts and opinions about the millennium, which we'll get to, as well as the new Jerusalem. And so again, I'll remind you, eschatology, you need to know what you believe. You don't need to believe anything that I tell you. Study. And when you write out your eschatology, best to do it in pencil. Don't etch it in stone, and please do your best, not allow Satan to use prophecy as a division or a dividing factor between brothers, okay? All right, let's move on. Uh, In seminary or Bible college or whatever, there's one class, you know, when you kind of have to take different Old Testament history, our survey, New Testament survey, and then you come down to what's called systematic theology. And uh, all Bible colleges and seminaries have this. The one class that's missing or the one subject that's missing in systematic theology is that of what I call Israelology, 
okay? The fact that so many people today have no idea of where Israel fits into the times in which we're living. And this is due to the fact that many, many, many have not an idea of God's totality of his plan of salvation. And if we're limited only to the New Testament, it's easy to jump into the group that I'll refer to as replacement theology. Simply put, the Jews rejected Jesus, their Messiah. So God rejects the Jewish people and he replaces all of his promises to the Jewish people with the church. And so forget about Israel and just focus in on the church at this point in time. That's heretical. It's not true. Bottom line, if it were true, we would make God to be a liar because God made unconditional promises to Israel. And he says in his word, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should repent. Have I said, will I not do it? And he is a God that's unchanging. And so just to give you a glimpse of Israelology in terms of the grand scope of salvation history from the garden to the gates of the new Jerusalem. The purpose of the tribulation, hear me, the purpose of the tribulation is for God to redeem and rescue and restore Israel. The church is raptured. The focus of God then becomes Israel. We have 144,000 Jewish messianics. We have two prophets on the Temple Mount. We have an angel circling the globe, preaching the everlasting gospel to all nations and all languages. The purpose of the tribulation is to redeem, restore, and rescue Israel. So when does the tribulation start? At, last night I gave a multiple choice question. Does it start at the end of the Ezekiel 37, 38, 39 war? 38, 39, I should say. Does it start when the Antichrist takes power? Does it start right after the rapture? When do you turn the hourglass over and say seven years from this point in time. No, it begins when the Antichrist makes a covenant with, drum roll please, Israel. That's when the tribulation starts. Satan's relationship to Israel. Now we'll get into this in a second, but it's my belief that part of this process and what we'll read in some passages in the Old Testament one in the new, is that Jesus is waiting to be invited back by the Jewish people for the second coming. So in Satan's mind, if he can wipe out the Jewish people, that invitation cannot be given because Satan knows the end of the book. Oh, he's aware of this lake of fire and his destiny. And by the way, let me insert this here. Many times we see these cartoon, fictional sort of things about heaven and hell. And all good people go to heaven and you go to the pearly gates and you see Peter and and clouds and harps and all of this sort of stuff. And then all the bad people, they go to hell. But when you see that depiction of hell, it's like, oh, yeah. Uh, Satan's got a throne down there. You know, it's just one massive party, kegger going on, you know, and it's like a highway to hell and all that. No, 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 no. Heaven means literally that we are with him, with him, connected. Hell abandoned, left, eternally 
detached. We'll fill in some of the blanks, but there's no throne. Satan's not having a party. Okay? It is eternal damnation. I, I, no, you can't wait more to come on that, right? All right. So there are in this tribute. So Satan wants to wipe Israel off the map. No big surprise. Anti-Semitism is thriving today. And who would have ever thought the biggest fear of the Jewish people today is will there be another Holocaust? At one point, it was never again what they went through in uh, Nazi Germany, one out of every three Jew was killed. And yet, what do we see as we look around the world today? The rising tide of anti-Semitism. And it's not hard to imagine what the Bible teaches about the end of days. That during this period that is referred to also not just as the great tribulation, but the time of Jacob's trouble. That we actually read that instead of one out of three, two out of every three Jew will be killed. Anti-Semitism, its roots. Satan knows his only chance is to wipe out Israel. And yet, God holds them in the palm of his hand. The, one, of them, one of the miracles, one of the, the I, I'm not sure I'd say number one, but one of the major proofs of the existence of God is simply this. There still is an Israel. After all they've been through, there still is an Israel today. All right. Tribulation period. I think there are four, back to Israelology, I think there are four groups of Jews. I think there are Jews that are apostate. I think that there are Jews two-thirds will die. They'll die without Jesus, which means they are not saved. That's the truth. There's only one way of assurance of salvation, and Jesus says it comes through him. There's no dual covenant whatsoever. But there are, as we know, people that will say no to God's gift of Jesus. So one of the groups will be this apostate Jewish group that will buy into this covenant with the Antichrist hook, line, and sinker. The second group, 144,000 protected. When we read about the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bulls and all of that, they are protected by God. They are the Jewish evangelists. And the third group will be the converts of their ministry. And I'll say it again. I think probably the largest mass of people coming to accept Jesus as Messiah and as Lord will come through the tribulation period. Why? Because it's not God's plan or will that any perish, no, not one. He is going to go out of his way to give everybody that opportunity to receive salvation. So I think it'll be massive people that come to know Jesus. But, and, and through the ministry of the 144,000, not just Jews, but Gentiles alone, Christians that were left behind, lukewarm Christians that were left behind, will come to their senses. We've said this before. The good news is salvation is available. The bad news, martyrdom, for the masses will be what takes place. Maybe not all, but for the masses. And then the fourth group is you have what I will refer to as the faithful remnant. Remember when Jesus was teaching about the end of days to a Jewish crowd, he said to them, when you see this one event takes place, referred to by the prophet Daniel, get out of town, flee. And we know that God has a place of refuge 
prepared for them in Edom, in a place called Petra. These are a faithful remnant that ultimately will come to know Jesus, but they heed these words because at that abomination of desolation, which happens halfway through the tribulation period, they're going to come to the realization that this global leader, this this genius that's been able to cobble together uh, the world after this massive vacuum of losing Russia, Iran, and Turkey in that Magog invasion, as well as the upheaval of the rapture that takes place, they're going to come to their senses because he's going to declare himself to be God. So they're going to flee and get out of town. That's the four groupings that I see. Now, my belief, remember when I talk about eschatology, know what you believe. My belief is that Jesus will not come back to the earth until the Jews and the Jewish leaders ask him to come back. As simple as that. Just as the Jewish leaders led the nation in rejecting the Messiahship of Jesus, they must someday lead the nation to the acceptance of his Messiahship. This then is the twofold basis of the second coming. The Israel must confess her national sin and then plead for Messiah to return. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Now, until these things happen, I don't think the second coming takes place. So, passages, Hosea 6, 1 through 3. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will heal us. Imagine this being the plea of the Jews during the tribulation. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the church. And then Hosea 5. I will return to my place. Now that infers that he's left it because he's going to return to it. I think that refers to the incarnation and the ascension. He's left to come to be the Lamb of God that's given his life as a ransom for the world. And at the ascension, he returns to his place until... They, the Jewish nation, they acknowledge their offense and then they will seek my face and in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And then Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And then they will look upon me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And finally, when Jesus is addressing the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees, he concludes by saying, for I say to you, you will see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At that invitation, I believe the second coming takes place. (coughs) So let's move on to chapter 20. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit 
and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and he shut him up, and he put a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, He must be released for a little while. Okay, let's unpack this. This is a dramatic declaration that Satan is not God's opposite or equal and that God could easily stop Satan's activity at any time. And yet God allows Satan to continue Because even in his evil, he indirectly serves the purposes of God. Bottom line, I love this quote by Sturgeon. The devil is still God's devil. Notice here that John sees an angel. He does not see, he doesn't name, it's an unnamed angel. It's not like, and I saw Michael, the great archangel, or I saw Gabriel coming. No, it seems like it's um, one of you. Harold, you in the back, come here. Some unnamed angel, and he's given the key to the bottomless pit, a chain, and it seems that there's no cosmic war that takes place in the heavenlies or whatever he lays hold of it satan the dragon and he casts him in the bottomless pit shuts him up sets a seal on him and by the way later after the thousand years it doesn't say that satan breaks out that he found a way to unseal this no god is in complete control And we have this picture of Satan. And and again, I don't want to mock in any way or lessen his deceptions because they're massive and we'll talk about that. But there will come a time in Isaiah. Isaiah says, chapter 14 says, there'll come a time that those that see him, those that gaze upon Satan, it says, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this, is this the man who made the earth tremble? No battle, no comparison. No, oh, I sure my money's on the Lord, you know, but it's going to be intense. What are the odds? You know, that sort of thing. No, 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 no. No equal, no opposite, created being. He could be spoken out of the world just like that. So Satan tries to imprison Jesus in a tomb, but he couldn't. But here, God has no problem restraining Satan. And this incarceration, not incarnation, this incarceration is not a punishment that comes later it's a restraint and i think by implications it's not just satan but his demonic hordes as well will be somehow in restrained and imprisoned but then we focus in on deceit and we know that the deceit or to deceive and is is satan's main mode of attack. He's a deceiver. He is a liar. So that the most potent defense against his weapon of deception is God's word. The truth of God's word. Friends, let me jump up on a soapbox now. We live in an age of deception and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Truth, what is truth, is being attacked. We want to, our culture and society wants to make truth 
relative, not absolute. Your truth may be different than my truth, but you need to respect my truth. Subjective, relative. Truth is unchanging. Truth is knowable. Truth is a source of freedom. Truth is stubborn. It's something, it's not something we can create. It is something that we discover. When we seek and we listen to the God of truth and study his word, we will find it. Truth keeps a man in his culture's pants up. And we read about that in Ephesians. In fact, all of these statements I'm giving you in your PowerPoint notes, there's biblical references to them. When we read that truth keeps a man's and his culture's pants up, it's because in Ephesians, truth is the belt that holds everything together in that spiritual warfare armor. Now, when truth is abandoned, it won't be long before the foolishness of men and the world in which we live in is exposed. Truth isn't just something that we can play with on our own terms without finding out the hard way what justice in eternity will be. truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. Truth. Truth is like light that dispels darkness. Again, truth is knowable. It's available. And the source of truth the word of God, the gift that God has given us. The word of God will illuminate darkness. He'll be a light into our path. Jesus uses the word of God when he battles Satan. After fasting 40 days, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. Satan knows the power of the word of God. And so he's done his best to dumb down the followers, the believers of Jesus. Let the experts teach the Bible. I'll be satisfied with a verse or two. No. As deception rolls in like a flood, like a tsunami, the word of God must be dispensed by everyday people. I believe the next great reformation, the next great revival will come not by when God reveals the next Billy Graham or Greg Laurie or whatever it may be, and we fill stadiums and all of that, it's not the wonderkin, but it's when everyday people simply say, you know, I was reading my Bible today, and this is what God said to me. Wow. That is the power behind the next major revival. Be in the game. Get off the bench. Be a participant, not a spectator. Okay, I'll step back off the soapbox. Let's now look at the millennium because now it's going to get dicey and, and complicated. And there's a lot of things that I don't know about the millennium. Let me say that up front. But I'm going to give you a list of things about the millennium that are scripture based. And how they cobble together, I'll allow God to do that. But... Here are some things that we read in the Bible about the millennium. And by the way, in this chapter, we're going to read a thousand days, a thousand, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand, six times, a thousand years. And so it, John does not say that, the men, that it will be like this, like a thousand years. No, he's, he gives specifics. 
And where those specifics are given, I believe that Jesus says what he means and means what he says. I believe there is a millennium and I believe it's a thousand years. Okay, big surprise there, right? So in the millennium, Jesus will sit upon his throne. I believe it will be the mercy seat and he will reign a thousand years. Jerusalem will be the capital. David, in his glorified body, will be somewhat of a governor or of a mayor that we read about in Jerusalem. The apostles will govern the 12 tribes of Israel. Prosperity will rule the earth. The nations will stream to the mountains of the Lord. And wherever you are, you will go up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. We're told that when Satan is imprisoned and his hordes, there will be no sickness, no cancer, no hospitals, no terrorism, no prisons, no abortion centers, no disease, no bigotry, no discrimination, and no government corruption. Okay? Sounds good so far, right? Now, during the millennium, and again, I'm telling you all scriptural basis. Get the PDF notes, the 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 verses, um, the where you find these passages are given there. During the millennium, Israel will be the superpower of the world, leading the nation in the leading nation in all the earth, and the center will be Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord's house. The citizens of the earth will acknowledge and submit to the lordship of Jesus. It will be a time of perfectly administrated, enforced righteousness on this earth. There will be no more war. There may be conflicts, but they will be justly and decisively resolved by the Messiah and those who reign with him. It isn't the reign of the Messiah itself that will change the heart of man. Citizens of the earth will still need to trust in Jesus and in his work and on their behalf for their personal salvation during the millennium. But war and armed conflict will not be tolerated. The way animals relate, this is going to be a massive change because we're told that a little child will be safe and able to lead a wolf, a leopard, a lion, a bear, that kids can play in the the holes of vipers or whatever. Um, it, It appears that there'll be a massive change amongst the animal kingdom, kind of taking us back to that Eden experience. And many think that during the reign of the Messiah that, um, will be vegetarians once again, back as it was before Genesis, before the fall. As I mentioned, King David has a prominent place in the millennial earth, ruling over Israel. Uh, There will be a blessing and security for national Israel. There will be a rebuilt temple and a restored temple service on the earth as a memorial and as a remembrance of God's work in the past. So there will be sacrifices that are given. And saints in their resurrected state will be given responsibility to assist Jesus in governing the millennial earth. And it will be according to their faithful service. And again, All the scriptural references are in your PowerPoint. And so let's back away and let's take another look at what's transpiring at this time. So John in verse four says, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Back to what we just referred to, assisting the saints, assisting in the governance of the millennial kingdom. And then I saw souls of those who had been beheaded. So now we're going to take a look at who's going to populate the earth during the millennium. 
He says, then I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness for Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Blessed, I'm sorry, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I think we've talked about that. I think we've established the fact that um, the faithful, the body of Christ will assist in the governance during the thousand years reign of Christ. And then we read this, blessed are those that are a part of the first resurrection. And so we're going to talk about that. Now, what is the first resurrection? Or, or in a sense, who populates the millennial kingdom? Well, in the beginning, when Jesus sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem after chapter 19 and 20, now, we know that the first resurrection is composed of the following. It will be Jesus. He's the first fruits. He's sinner. He's, he's ruling on earth, okay, in Jerusalem. And then we're told the dead in Christ. All of those that have given their lives to Jesus and have died will be resurrected in their glorified body and will populate the earth during the millennium. And then we have those that were raptured, okay? That before the tribulation seven years unfolded, the pre-trib rapture that takes place, the body of Christ during this period of time, the marriage feast of the Lamb, the bride of Christ, we, if we're alive during that, our bodies will be transformed and we too will populate the millennium in a glorified body state. And then also it's inferred that the Old Testament saints will be given their, in a sense, glorified bodies. And so all of these above will be present during the millennial kingdom. Now, earthly bodies... There will be apparently survivors of the tribulation, but saved survivors. The only people that are going to populate the millennium in the beginning are those that are saved, believing in the Messiahship and the sacrificial gift of Jesus. There will be believing Gentiles in their earthly bodies that may make up some of these survivors. There will be redeemed Israel. Remember, those that were rescued from Petra, that place of protection. I believe they're saved. They come to know Jesus, but they will be part of the millennial kingdom in their earthly bodies as well. And then finally, it's important to note that heavenly glorified bodies, that group will not reproduce. No children born to them. But the survivors, the believing Gentiles, the redeemed Israel, children will be born during the thousand year reign. All right, is it clear? <laughs> Now, verse 7, now when the thousand years have expired, and we talked about the, the no disease, no sickness, and all those sort of things, it's perfect, but it's an imposed righteousness, okay? We're going to talk about the heart of man now. 
especially among the children that are born during the millennium. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released. Remember, he doesn't break out, okay? Satan is released, whether it's Harold or Bob, one of those angels will go and open it up, okay, and unlock the chains. Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations. How effective will he be? To deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number will be as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth. They surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, no doubt Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them now, note, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. There's no doctrine of annihilation where the dead cease to remember or exist. Okay, let's let's think this through. There will probably be, be more people during this period of time than any other do to the perfect environment. No disease, no, no defects, no child, no nothing, no abortion or whatever. And so even after a thousand years, however, of this perfect imposed righteous reign, there is enough evil resident in the heart of man that given when given a choice, an opportunity, he still rebels. Friends, we belong to a fallen race. And every human is born with the ability or essentially an evil nature. A perfect environment still reveals the fallen nature of man. A perfect environment cannot produce a perfect heart. The serious nature of our own heart can only be known by the word of God, Jeremiah 17. Now, after a thousand years, we read here that the beast and the false prophet are still in the lake of fire. As I mentioned, no doctrine of annihilation. And then God has to deal before we get the new Jerusalem coming down, a new beginning He's got to wrap all of this up. And we have this sin condition of man. And how is that going to come to an end? Verse 11, then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat on it was, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, great, standing before God, and books, plural, was opened, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up all of its dead that was in it, and death and Hades, they delivered the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades, that's that concept of Sheol, paradise or whatever. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the end. This is the second resurrection or the second death. You've probably seen the t-shirts before that says, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. You must be born again. Your name must be written in the Lamb's 
book of life. So before God can usher in his new heavens and new earth, he must finally deal with sin. And this is what he does at the great white throne judgment. The Bible tells us that the judge, the one that will be seated on the great white throne, is more likely to be seen as Jesus because judgment is given to him. We read about that in John 5, verses 22 through 27. But no doubt it will be the fullness of the Trinity. And again, the second resurrection of the dead will be judged. I don't believe we will be there. I don't know if we see it off in the distance. It's cryptic, but we're saying that all of earth and heaven, what was the phrase, as as fled away. I think it's a moment where time will actually come to an end as we comprehend time. And judgment takes place here before, as we mentioned, we experience a new heaven, a new somewhat existence, and a new earth. Well, we'll conclude with this. We're running out of time. We're told that books were open. And on the last slide, I've given you um, references to different books or references scripturally of this. So whether it's the, you blot me out of the book that you've written, uh, whether it's the book of life, whether it's the Lamb's book of life, Uh, whether it's the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Uh, We were told, don't rejoice over seeing all these spiritual powers that you have, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Uh, We're talking about in Psalm, a book of remembrance. Uh, God says, you number my wanderings, you put my tears in a bottle. God is an amazing bookkeeper, okay? Okay. Uh, One of my favorites is a book of remembrance that's referred to in Malachi 3.16, where it says that those that feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him about those that feared the Lord and meditated upon his name. And I told our group last night, I think that that book of remembrance, I think every time we gather together and we talk about Jesus and we pray and we meditate upon him and as we study his word, I think it's noted in this book. But ultimately the one book that you must have your name written in is the Lamb's Book of Life. And it is available to you right now. If you're not sure your name is written in that book, take the time now to simply ask Jesus to come into your heart, to forgive your sins, to accept him as the Lord of your life. Upon doing that, we're told that your name then will be written in the book of life. And may that be a passion we have in the days in which we're living to share the simple gospel message with a lost and dying world. Well, we're coming to the end. We've got a couple chapters left. Uh, It might take us two more weeks. And then we're going to have for our old-fashioned Bible study what I call the Great Reveal. And I can't wait for that because in a few weeks we'll talk about where are we going from here? What are we studying next? With that, God bless you. Shalom. And I hope to see you next week.